So our next topic is lattice space cryptography. So to start with the definition, a lattice is a discrete subgroup of R to the N. So we have a small example with just two dimensions and you see lots of dots here that follow a very regular pattern. And it's individual dots, that's what it means to be discrete. And well, you can see differences and additions of those in a very regular manner. We normally represent a lattice but, uh, with the help of two basis vectors or n basis vectors in general. So here you see b1 and b2, and then you can get every dot that's drawn here as some integer linear combination of these two vectors. So for instance, you get here by taking two times b2, you get here as minus b1, you get here by going, well, minus b, well, you get uh, just the difference of the two vectors, and so on and so forth. Now, we have these two vectors, but there are many other ways of describing this lattice. So here are different, well, each color is, is giving you a different basis. So also the green two vectors, B4, uh, B5 and B6 form a basis, or the blue ones, B3 slightly off uh, on the right here, and B4 form a basis. And so when we, when we talk about this in mathematics, we want to, um, well, we use coordinates for this, so we're using coordinates over the reals and then each of these vectors in this case it's a two-dimensional lattice so there are two coordinates of each vector and then we write them well i've chosen to write them row wise depending which book you follow you might also find them uh, column wise and well to get back to these different bases so for instance if i have the green bases here and i want to get to the red bases or the other way around then there is some matrix um, in between those now, I'm only allowed to take integer combinations of these vectors. So this has to be an integer matrix. And, well, it has to be something which is um, invertible. Now, because, I mean, if I can get from B prime to B, I also have to get back from B to B prime. So the invertibility of a matrix of the integers, that requires that the determinant of this matrix is either plus one or minus one and we call such matrices unimodular so matrices where the determinant has absolute value one and so when you get the green matrix oops i realized i messed up on the indices here these should all be four and so on not one two um, if i get the green basis from the red basis this u will have well, in this case, four integer coefficients and determinant plus or minus one. So that is a lattice in two dimensions. Here is a drawing of a lattice in three dimensions. We normally don't draw these things. I will often draw two-dimensional examples, but keep in mind that higher dimensions get really, really complicated. So when you say, hey, in two dimensions, I just see what the solution is, that's no longer the case already in three dimensions. Well, okay. In three-dimensional space, if we have an object somewhere, we can still get pretty good ideas. But in general, we go for mathematical abstractions. So we write the lattice as an integer linear combination for a given basis. So we have some vectors b1 until bn. All of those live in r to the n. And then we take integer coefficients ai and sum them, well, ai, bi, sum them up. Most of the times, we're working with full rank lattices. That means that the basis that is given there is actually spanning a space of dimension n and not of something smaller. Then the things we're looking for in those lattices are often short vectors or closed vectors. And for that we need, first need to have a measure of shortness. We just use the L2 norm or called the Euclidean distance. So if you have a vector with coefficients c1 till cn, then the length of this is the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates. So that means right, it's just one of the normal norms and this is the most common noun when we look at as distances. So if you're looking at all the elements at distance one, that will be a circle. If you'd be using other norms, you might have a box or something else. And then the shortest vector problem is to find any vector that has the shortest length. So it's not a unique short vector because, well, in this lattice you see that this v1 here is the shortest vector. But actually, no, it's not the shortest vector, it's just a shortest vector because minus v1 
is just as short. So there is a minimal length, but there can be one or more vectors of the shortest length. And the SVP is to find one of those. And of course, yeah, it would be trivial if you would be allowed to put output the zero vector. So it's the sure. shortest non-zero vector in the, in the lattice. We have exponential time algorithms to compute these short vectors exactly. And we have polynomial time algorithms to compute approximate solutions. And of course, the time depends on how good you want this approximation. Another typical vector is the closest uh, problem in lattices is the closest vector problem, which says, okay, given some dot in space, this x here, find a point that is in the lattice that is closest to it. Or find something which is within some approximation. And then similar to the SAP, it is exponential time in normal, so about CPV, even though it's NP hard. But if we are relaxing this and say, well, we want something which is just somewhat close. So anything within some cloud, within some loose circle or ellipse here, but that could be a bigger one, for instance. This could also be a valid size. So if we have a nice, nice uh, basis, which is close to orthogonal, which has short vectors, then we can basically just project or round to the closest in each of the directions, each of the coordinates and get something good. If you have a very skewed basis, think of these very long vectors in blue on the first slide, then we probably don't get the right vectors. And so how do we get short vectors? So let me sh first show you the LLL algorithm, or first motivate what the LLL algorithm does for you. Um, you're given it a basis, some, well, all it needs to be is the basis, and it outputs another basis which is shorter and more orthogonal. Well, okay, if you want to try some of the same thing, you'll get exactly the same. So it doesn't always make it better, but for a random basis, you get something which is better. Better in the sense that those other um, estimates, well, SVP and CVP, get easier to solve. And the way that the algorithm works is very similar to Gramsci and orthogonalization. So an algorithm that you've seen in linear algebra early on. So you're basically, well, you're taking a vector similar to the rows in Gram-Schmidt, and you're using it to reduce the other vectors. And then normally you're computing, well, the inner product between the first vector and the other vectors, and, you, well, you're getting these coefficients mu i j here, and then you're using that to figure out how to reduce them. Now, this is actually doing all of them at once. When you're doing normal Gaussian innovation, you're just doing two at once, but the full Gram-Schmidt is taking all of the previous ones to reduce the current one. One problem is, though, that these mu ij's here, they're dividing by um, this inner product from the, well, basis vectors or start basis vectors here, and that means that these values are not integers. So the bj stars are not in the lattice, at least not typically. And so even though we use these mu ij's, we can't use them exactly, but we can use them rounded. And then the LLL algorithm computes these coefficients and also uses them as a, as a termination condition, namely a lattice, is, a lattice basis is LLL reduced if all of these mu and j's which are taken the inner products there are less than a half for all combinations except for the identical one. And well, then there is a parameter delta that comes in where you can choose it between, well, one quarter and one. And depending on this delta, you have a condition about the length of the previous basis vector to the next one. Well, what you expect is that the first vector is the shortest, followed by the next, followed by the next, and so on. And this one gives you a little bit of a slack there. The guarantee for the output basis is that the vector is, well, this short. Now, the determinant of the basis, we know that any change gives you a unimodular lattice, so that's an invariant of the lattice. The n is just the dimension that comes in, and then there's a factor in front of it where the same delta comes in. There are some estimates of how long the vectors are depending on the basis, and this says you're not too far away from the shortest, but it's still an exponential factor. So that means it's an approximate solution, it's not the shortest. But depending on how 
nice or not nice the lattice is, LL gets you pretty far already. So I put here um, the algorithm because, well, you need to see it at some point. But instead of going through this, I'll do some moving around with PDF files. Um, I'm going to show you really nice visualizations by Tal Slahoven. Uh, you can get the slides at this URL. And you do need to use Acrory that doesn't work in, say, events or something. So what you see here um, is basically Gramschmidt, except for you actually have multiple runs through it. And um, that one is because, well, once you have reduced one row with the next, and you're moving on to the third, well, that might actually also affect the other ones. Because we can't use, well, real coefficients or fractional coefficients, we do have to go up and down. Now, what you see here is um, the color indicates the size. So the diagonals, the ones here are in light gray. The black numbers you don't see, these are very large numbers, at least compared to 0 and 1. Um, and then what LL is doing in the first steps is it reduces the first row with the second row. Well, okay, so they have now swapped basically. So they compared, swapped, the second one was found to be smaller. And then we're now reducing the second row with the first row. And then the third row with the first row and so on and so on and so on. And you see it is going down, it's going up again, it's doing some swaps there. And well, I'm just letting this run because it's a nice animation, but watch at which rows are operating. It will often go all the way back to the back, uh, to the top. And it's always comparing two of those at once. Now it has done the last row and is still percolating those changes through. And there was still another round. Okay, and then Tice has also made um, the same animations for larger sets, so for larger dimensions. So same setup. Um, well, let's just watch it. So at the beginning, the first things are filled in with black just because that means it's large numbers, but you can actually um, see how those numbers slowly get lighter grays because you're getting reductions coming in. Now this is sort of an artifact that the bulk of the matrix starts very small and just the leftmost column is a one. But you see how this smears out. And this is actually a very typical situation when you uh, set up LLL for certain um, attacks. So for instance, if you did the cryptology uh, lecture with me in the first quarter, uh, in the first semester, then you have seen LLL as a tool to attack um, RSA. And then we often get lattices which have an identity matrix or something close to an identity matrix and then just one full column or row. Now LL is not the end of the story. In the next lecture we're going to see some algorithms which actually get um, closer to optimal. So these ones are approximate. We have some algorithms which find the shortest but take a very long time. And then you can also combine those. So LLL, depending on the delta, gets you well, reasonably close, but won't get you very close, but is running in polynomial time. There is a combination which is called BKZ, Bloch, uh, uh, called Kares uh, I didn't go over well. Um, and that one is combining elements of LLL, but it's using it in blocks. And then, well, here, it's always comparing two vectors, and from those two vectors it finds the shortest. In BKZ, we're also finding the shortest, but for a whole block of rows. And then you typically, for those blocks of rows, uh, use one of the exponential time algorithms, and then combine those into a bigger one, where then you're doing a similar swap that you see here in the LL. So if you download those, you can also play the very large LL, but I'll just show you the end state of that and the end state of a BKZ, which if you compare the end state of the LL, you still see a gradient from darker colors over here on the left to lighter colors on the right. Whereas the BKZ, which is going in blocks, is avoiding this and has a bit more of a uniform structure. And so with BKZ, you get something better. More to come.